All right, and we're live. Welcome back to the philosophy of art and science, everyone. Today, we are joined by my dear and beloved Uhoya, or my brother, Woodwandme Diakon Tariku. He's a brother who we like to claim in Los Angeles, even though he properly lived in Santa Barbara because he used to come visit us in LA on the weekends to do some services. But he's also spent some time in Atlanta and of course in Gwandar. And we're about to get into a heavy subject, uh, a potentially controversial polemic this subject, but I think it's one that needs to be presented. And in order for it to come in the right nuance and context, Deacontariko, our brother, I would like you to, to introduce everybody to just a little bit, maybe not your entire life story, but if you could give us a little bit of your journey, because I, I think, and I'll bring it up later, I think that our background and context affects our thinking. It doesn't control it because we always have a certain will, but I think a certain amount of factors always influenced us. And I've seen that in my own life, how my own certain viewpoints have changed over time in relation to which environment I've been in. And, and I, I've always pushed myself to, to be in different environments so I can try to be, you know, like a scientist and objective looking at, at whatever, you know, cultural pulls I, I may have because of any of my identities. You can start in Gwandar or in LA or in Atlanta, anywhere, but yeah. tell us a little bit, man. Tell us a little bit. Thank, thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And uh, man, where do I start? I can start at Gwandar, like you said, from the OG, the original city, that uh, that's where I was born. I came to the United States uh, my teenage years. I'm not gonna tell you exact age, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I came to Atlanta. Um, so yeah, you're right. The background kind of impacts the way you think. Sometimes subconsciously, you don't even know uh, that is what is impacting you. But mm -hmm. um, I was born in a communist uh, Ethiopia. I grew up uh, in a communist Ethiopia, a uh, very small village in Gondar. Not in the city of Gondor, but uh, mm -hmm. close by, but small village. So I uh, came to the United States, got my education, engineering degree, became a deacon at the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And that's how me and Oye Henok got linked up some way, somehow. Amen. But um, yeah, so pro professional engineer here in Atlanta. I uh, work at the Air Force for about eight years and... Uh, Moved to LA, working with uh, SpaceX. I see the Occupy Center. Mars shirt. We don't see the Mars yes. on the screen, but I, I know what that yeah. shirt is. I see that Occupy Mars. I follow Re Musk's represent. movement. Represent, <laughs> sir. Yeah, so I work I work with Elon Musk, and uh, the uh, the shuttle that just went to the International Space Station a few mm -hmm. days ago, the original concept started when I started working there in 2013. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and for people's reference, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the first American one, right? That shows the reliance of America, even though it's not the government, it's not NASA per se. It is a kind of a, a contract bid from, from SpaceX, and it's not having to depend upon the Russians to get to the space yes. station. Yes, the first private uh, entity that launched a rocket to the International Space Station. So it is it's a big deal. Uh, I know you like this, Sinoke, uh not being a government uh, <laughs> entity doing all this kind of cool stuff. So yeah, so I worked there uh, for about three years uh, due to personal you know, family circumstances that I'm away. I know you know, mm -hmm. and okay, but I have to come back to Atlanta. Uh, so that's, that's basically it in a nutshell without expounding the whole life's history of mine. No, I, I appreciate that. That gives us a, a general view and movement. And I'll tell you some of the reasons and, and factors I think that I think are a part of the, the milieu or setting in, in which you came to your own conclusions on yourself, right? Every individual ends up, especially the critical critically thinking ones. And, you know, if you're not critically thinking, you're going to be allergic to me. So I know by, by being a, a good friend of mine, I know you're, you're automatically going to be a critical thinker, even if people have different points of, of view. And uh, some of the things I think about today's Juneteenth, right? In America, a lot of us are celebrating 
this uh, bisrat, this anun- this announcement or annunciation of the proclamation that freed the slaves, and they're hearing it two years later. You know, just like the Lord's message keeps getting announced years and years after it's originally proclaimed, the proclamation of freedom to the slaves in the United States to black Americans was pronounced over a certain amount of time. And a lot of folks, I think, especially the younger folks, are getting really active and in, and involved in in different debates. Some of them formally in the Democratic Party, I think, as a majority, but but some of them in other outside organizations and movements like Black Lives Matter and things like this. It is within this context that you and I were discussing off camera this letter from an archbishop in the Roman Catholic um, jurisdiction, uh, under their jurisdiction, and that's Archbishop Carl Vigano. And it was an interesting read. I, I read through it. He, he uses you know powerful biblical language and and some kind of inside baseball political language which has been expanded right he talks about the forces of light and the forces of darkness and he talks about the the deep state so can you tell us a little bit about the archbishop's letter uh to to president donald trump and then it, it, you know tell us you know what what that made you think of or it, it, anything related to sort of the current political milieu yeah, so, um, you know, our political culture has kind of uh, got to the point where it's, it's, it's frowned upon to discuss things that are outside of the, you know, the general context. And so before I read the letter that you just talked about, I had this in the back of my mind. Uh, what is in these forces, you know, all the pro- protests, the riots and uh, of course that I understand the, you know, the, the overall, you know, a lot of people are there because of, you know, police brutality and the murder of, you know, African-American men and all that. But deep inside me, I always think of like, what is, what is in it, you know? And I know, you know, that the, my views of the democratic party here in this country and so I came across this letter and it got me thinking, well, interesting. Uh, so there is something substantial about what is inside me, what, what I'm thinking about, you know, uh, what is happening in this country right now. So the Archbishop is basically saying that there is, um, there is a deep state actors in what is happening here. Uh, I don't think that he is denying the fact that uh, there is injustice uh, and there is police brutality uh, against African American people of color, but there is more to the story than uh, a lot of us. A lot of people think of it is that uh, you know this president uh, is a pro-life, and if you ask me that, does Donald Trump really have this ideological view of you know pro-life or? Uh, not, I don't. I don't think so. But nonetheless, <laughs> I know why you're laughing because you agree with me. But we all know that that's not a kind of man he is. But nonetheless, he's mm-hmm. the first president to stand up for pro-life. Right? Uh, set aside his personal view or his intellectual understanding of the whole, you know, the whole thing. Uh, for me, it is irrelevant because of the office he holds. You know. And so this archbishop talked about, you know, you are the first president uh, standing up for pro-life. In the and, March for Life, I believe, in, in Washington, D.C. area. Yep, yep. And I think there is a movement. There is this movement. I don't know how to s- describe it politically, but uh, which is against the whole Christian concept. You know, praying in school, uh, school zones, school areas having um, anything related to Christianity. You know, it's, it's becoming frowned upon to be a Christian in this country. And I think that's the least talked about topic and that this archbishop is uh, is kind of giving a moral support to the president. And that's why I would not have shared it to anyone else, but I felt like it was a safe space for me to share it with you 
Yeah, um, and we'll we'll share it. We'll share it with our watchers. You know, you you were uh, a watcher of this show, and that's how you you got on the show too. So thank you for that. And we'll put a link when we put this up on YouTube. We'll put a, a link so that people could read it on their own. One of the things I learned early on in history that I think helps shed light on things is something that you learn in kindergarten in the United States. I don't know if they had this in Moaila Hasanat in your village in Gwandar, but here in kindergarten they have a, a game called telephone where you whisper something into someone's ear and then they whisper something to someone else's ear and you go on. It's supposed to be the same message. But by the time that it's transferred through all these different people's ears, the message gets very diluted. So one of the things right. I learned in history is to give people the primary sources. They're going to make whatever determination they make. So all you can do is make sure that they have as informed a decision-making process as possible. So we'll give them the link to that, that speech to see that they could put any light on it. It's very interesting that that you mentioned um, what that is. Uh, Abba Thomas Finley or Father Thomas Finley gave me a book that was never completed by Father Seraphim Rose, one of these great figures in American Orthodox Christianity. And he talked about these three great forces and they kind of just feed into each other, right? Secular humanism, postmodernism, and nihilism. Very briefly, secular humanism is the idea of trying to be religious without an explicit God. And it comports very well to what a lot of people, I think, who listen to NPR, who watch CNN, and who vote Democrat down the line, um, you know, uncritically, no matter what, who, no matter who's there, I think that comports very well. If we were to draw a Venn diagram, it might look like a circle. And um, I, in, in another sense, there's this phrase from a writer that I had on the show to discuss Ethiopian history recently, Curtis Yarvin. He says the cathedral. And the, the way he uses the word cathedral is to refer to the, this group that you're talking about, this, this kind of quasi-religious group, but that's not maybe necessarily formally meeting on Sundays, uh, praising a deity in an explicit way. He considers their priesthood, their institutions that they formed, a kind of rival priesthood. And so he believes that they view Christianity as a rival religion. And so the antagonism that you see between these, these forces, and, and it's not always clear, you know, if the links are there. He, he personally argues that the links are not sometimes direct. It's just that they have layers upon layers upon layers mm -hmm. of this intellectual knowledge that comes out of the certain elite universities, which then becomes the basis of a, a lot of their knowledge and, and why they would be antithetical to to this worldview. So, so that's interesting. Um, it, you said it helped you frame some of the thoughts, it, if I could put it in another way. It yeah. helped you make explicit what you kind of implicitly um, knew, on, knew on the inside. Was there anything novel in there or was there anything unexpected or, or different in, in the Archbishop Carl Vigano's letter? Yeah, what I found unexpected was the fact that uh, the, the Catholic Church uh, under the regime of uh, the new uh, Pope, Pope Francis, um, he has a very... A a very he's a different person, mm -hmm. the way he views uh, the world politically, and it's kind of deviant from his view. The Archbishop view is definitely not the Pope's view. I think that's my understanding anyway. Mm -hmm. And I found it surprising that this Archbishop came out with this letter uh, publicly. Um, but the rest is is basically what you know what I implicitly have been thinking inside, and what I thought is happening uh, in the American political culture. So uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, breaking things that I I got, but that's that's what I found most surprising. Yeah. So you know, just reflecting on the fact of the kind of police murders and brutality that we're talking about, and then also with it being Juneteenth. And you being a black man who lives in the South, what is what is it like? What is the energy like? How you know? How do you feel on a on a personal level? I mean, we saw some interesting images, right, coming out of Atlanta, 
We, yeah. we saw that CNN owned building where the police precinct was right with all the smoke yeah. grenades. We saw the mayor call this earnest meeting and you have a, a black woman who's a mayor and then you see T.I. and Killer Mike. Killer Mike. Are some singers I listen to, especially Killer Mike, I like more than T.I. For, and I've seen him live and I've, ever since Madden 04, I've been listening to Killer Mike. I, I, lo uh, I love his views too. His political man, views is just dope. Man, yeah. he's, he's unique, man. He, and he's Very also unique. a black man from the South. He's got yeah. liberal or progressive views, but he's also, uh, you know what I'm saying, a heterosexual black man from the South. Yeah, is the, and those those salient identities, they mean something. They don't bind him in his thinking, but they they are reasons for which, um, you know, maybe the options in which he would have thought would be in that way. You know, like uh, so. In in any event, how how have you been? processing it all and you know they own half the west side of atlanta so part of me was thinking in my head like i had I thought of one of two things one are they thinking of this like as they got a lot of money invested in there and don't break my stuff uh, <laughs> because killer mike was wearing a shirt that said kill your masters or yeah. some people on the internet were suggesting that he was actually telling people go home for now and plot and organize how you can properly kill your masters. And he was doing some sort of like subliminal messaging by wearing that t-shirt. Whereas yeah. other people were just saying he's he's fake. He's like Uncle Tom because he's wearing that t-shirt, but he doesn't mean it. And he's telling us to to stop breaking stuff. But breaking stuff is is how we how we get genuine change because that's how we yeah. get the white folks' attention. Uh, heard them in their pockets. So I, how, how are you processing it all? Um, you know, Atlanta, it's not just the west side of Atlanta, by the way. They own the whole city of Atlanta. <laughs> they um, in the Georgia Dome, too. I know he got that barbershop in the Georgia Dome. Georgia Dome, yeah. I mean, the whole Atlanta is uh, mecca of hip hop. So, uh, there are a lot Harry of moved down there, too. So, so film, black film, too. Black film, we have they have their own studio with uh, uh Perry Tyler Perry, a huge studio here. Um, he bought from the uh, U.S. Air Force, by the way. It was an old army base where the slaves used to be sold. Wow. At. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, With a Habasha, so he, big Habasha community too. And he's got that Habasha yeah. Bay, who I'm convinced yeah. is the reason why he released that Mary Did You Know track. Well, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> possibly. But there's a lot of uh, interconnected things in Atlanta. But, you know, Atlanta is, uh, you know, Atlanta is it's hard to consider Atlanta as the South. You know what I mean? Yeah, because the whole culture is uh, there's African American population is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big immigrant community here as well, and so the city of Atlanta is not really the South. Uh, if you, I know what you mean. Like, it, it's it's yeah. definitely going to be bluer, more progressive, and liberal than like the outer skirts of Georgia. But you got to remember, I'm from the West Coast, bro. I'm part of that elitist right. group and the and the coastal elite. <laughs> that is so true. For That's us, true. For us, that's the South. That's the South. <laughs> <laughs> south of the, you know, Bible Belt. That's the South. Yeah, oh, indeed. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, even politically, it's a deep blue Atlanta. You know, the mayor's, even, even the state, oh, you, we almost got uh, uh, the governor, a black governor, by the way. Mm -hmm. Almost. Uh, this is the closest election that we ever had in history. And she's a uh, prospect to be the vice president. Is it her or is it the mayor of Atlanta that's been considered? I think it was Stacey Abrams. Stacey, Stacey Abrams, who's, uh, who's, uh, who came so close to be the, mayor, the, the governor of the state of Georgia. Um, but, you know, the, politically they're active, the hip hop community here in Atlanta. And so I, 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 I love Killer Mike because he's very <laughs> genuine. He, he's very genuine personality. And uh, I don't, I don't, I don't consider him to be fake. And I think uh, his message for for people to be, you know, to stay put and not to get into riots and breaking stuff. And for one thing, Atlanta is not uh, is not like any other city. Even the police, of course, you know, we had that unfortunate murder mm -hmm. a few days later. Uh, but to the most part, uh, you don't see. Uh, that much of police br brutality here in Atlanta as much as you see other cities. So uh, his message of people to go home and just, 
you know, stay active politically, vote, do your research, you know, force, force the people you're electing to do work. You know, don't just vote them because they're Democrat. Don't just vote them because they're black. Vote for them uh, because they do something in your community, you know. Do they bring investment to your community? That's that's the key that uh, you have to look at. Well, that's the message of Killer Mike, and uh, I, I I think he's very genuine, to say the least. That's good. Yeah, that's good, and and it's good to to hear that from you. Was there any anything else that's been on your mind lately? Be it political, cultural, or anything that you would like to have some closing thoughts on. You know, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that letter, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on Carl it, yeah. Vigano's letter? Um, I think I expressed it a little bit, but I think he's pointing to this thing that, that I talked about, right? This cathedral, this deep state, this oligarchy that is in charge, which is predominantly antithetical to traditional organizational religions that arose in the axial age, you know, in the first BC, you know, the main ones like Buddhism, Judaism, and then the later ones like our Christianity and Islam. And they're replacing it with a more modern religion, which really comes out of the enlightenment in response to the rule of kings and all of these things. They first go with deism where they say there's this grand clockmaker and that's god he just puts the universe into being and then he doesn't do anything ever again he doesn't intervene and then slowly but surely they form things called unitarianism then they call it universalist unitarianism and then frankly they drop the label and just keep pursuing a more french revolution than an american one the american revolution was the freedom of religion, meaning everyone gets to practice their religion in whatever space you want to practice it. And, uh, you know, as long as you're not invading somebody else's personal private space, the French Revolution went in a different direction. They said the freedom from religion. This is why you see arguments that you're not allowed to wear crosses in public in French spaces. You see arguments where they don't want you to wear a burqa at the beach which to me is like antithetical to this idea of freedom. You know, the French understanding is very different. And anyway, they keep, they keep pursuing that and they base it off of certain ways of thinking and certain ways of acting so that it's not necessarily one centralized grand conspiracy, but it's that certain elite institutions uh, keep breeding and keep spitting out intellectuals who frankly aren't intellectuals a historian i like thaddeus russell likes using the term thinker and so does another probabilist i like an independent scholar named uh, nicholas nasim uh, nasim nicholas taleb he also uses that word thinker in, disting in distinguishing it from intellectual a thinker meaning someone who's not bound to certain institutions who's ready to assess the data based off of evidence and be willing to change their mind. But in trying to go against these formal organized religions, they've established, like I said earlier, their own royal priesthood, their own religion, and it's hard for them to see outside of that. And in fact, this is why they view themselves as unbiased. You'll hear them using terms, we're non-partisan. Nobody could be non-partisan. At best, the bipartisan, the only libertarian, now there's a libertarian in the House, introduced yeah. legislature to get, get rid of uh, immunity for police. And he introduced it as the first tripartisan legislature. And I love that because they're all Democrats and Republicans, but now there's one libertarian. And yeah. so he called it tripartisan because he got a co-signer who was a Democrat and a co-signer who was Republican. So you can be, bi you could be um, uni unipartisan or just partisan. You could be bipartisan, you could be tripartisan, you could be multi-partisan if there are other yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can't be non. You can't be non. Non means you don't think. Non means you have no opinion. <laughs> non means you're an amoeba. You know, you don't have a vertebrae. You know? Yeah. If you have a vertebrae, you have an opinion. You know? Yeah, I think I think that's people people's way of saying, you know, you know, I am I'm not there, I'm from the outside, you know. Yeah, and, and that the issue yeah. is that they're stuck in this milieu of people who are highly educated, who have master's degrees 
and PhD degrees predominantly in, so in the social sciences and even more in the humanities who are losing track of, of grounded realities from scientific truths that you would know a lot about as an engineer and instead just keep basing things off uh, theories that are divorced from practice that they opine on in their chairs or in their ivory towers or in their think tanks. And then they just keep begetting these policies that lead to the same results, that lead to the Federal Reserve that keeps printing money, that lead to having $16 trillion in debt. What does that even mean anymore? By, by yeah. leads to having <laughs> spending as much as the entire world. And so uh, are these people actively working to try to get rid of Donald Trump in a sense? Probably, yeah, they're, they're probably doing their best while not revealing themselves. But, right. you know, how much has he changed? If you ask me to assess, I don't know how, how functionally different he is from o Obama and from Bush. To me, he's not that different. He has some things that are different to me that are mostly about presentation and style. But in substance, you know, he's, he's continued some of the same things that, that they have. You know, there are a few, a few things, you know, um, that I've seen that I am against and then the things that I commend against, obviously, the, the animism and the vitriol poured at, at immigrants, at the child of immigrants, but also willing to commend, like, what he's done through Betsy DeVoe to allow further mediation cases, which were not allowed in, in certain cases in universities, what he did in my field of arbitration by allowing certain things to be arbitratable, which were not before. Um, but uh, he's more peaceful with North Korea, but he's more warmongering with Iran, you know? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to assess these things. It's not one or the other, but the important thing is like, I look at Daniel from the Bible who finds a way to get along with all these different regimes that come and go, but the one yeah. who, you know, always in control is God. And, and so I, I appreciate that. And, and I liked your message of, of local, of trying to, trying to get people to, to focus on issues more than just a party. What are yeah. the local issues that affect me that will bring practical change? And I ask people that sometimes between Bush, Obama, and Trump, what has actually changed in your life? I ask people that question because a lot of this stuff are these grand theories that are divorced from the way in which people actually live. And so I constantly just want to ask people, what has practically changed in your life? And then I, I try to encourage and exhort people to, to behave according to what is actually changing their lives and, and you know, begin and be more bottom up than, um, than top down in, in their thinking. Yeah, I, I think we have become, uh, we have this hard mentality politically. Um, I was talking to this priest that you know that I wouldn't name names here on public, but uh, he is a big uh, proponent of, opponent of uh, President Trump, and he's a big, uh, big fan of Obama. Uh, he's an Orthodox priest, and I, we always talk about, like, you know, what, in your Christian belief, you know, in your Christian belief, what do you think that Obama does in his liberal views of abortion and whatnot that you support? And I go line by line on things and on things like that, and he says, no, I don't support that. I don't support that. I don't support that. And then we go on talking about, you know, President Trump. Like I said, I don't think Trump personally even understands uh, simple ideological views. But nonetheless, he does things that I like that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I don't necessarily think that he's a racist man, but that's a whole different topic. Um, so people don't look at things and they don't base their vote based on that, you know? There's this hard mentality. If you're black, if you're immigrant, then you have to vote Democrat. That's automatic. It's like you don't even think these days. If you speak something against that line of thought, then, you know, you are, you are something, something bad. And so I really appreciate that uh, you uh, understand the, the, the point of view that I'm coming from. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I had someone very close to me who um, they cannot vote 
they they've chosen not to be a citizen even though they've been here for decades and uh, what's interesting though they financially supported barack obama and when i asked them what was their reasoning they said my reasoning is because he's black and because black people need to see a black man in that office it may not be an immediate effect but just that is in itself enough of a statement enough of a message for me that the other issues are not as much a priority for me that that in itself is That's enough fair. and yeah i appreciate it even though i don't agree i yeah. appreciated the candidness the candor the straightforwardness and the honesty in explaining because at least as i mentioned earlier they're at least thinking critically they're saying that for the things in my life the, all these other stuff are trimmings they're not that relevant but having a black man in that office is going to give people a little bit less despair and a little bit more hope who were downtrodden before and so i understood the line of thinking even if i didn't agree with it i understood the line of thinking and i was yeah. like thank you i just want a little bit more honesty like that <laughs> that is pretty honest i don't know if, uh, how much of you know uh, travis smiley travis smiley yeah he yeah he's got, he got a radio show yeah he does have a radio show and uh, he's uh, a big media personality and he wrote a book on obama's presidency in detail uh, in great detail and how people of color regressed in every facet of life in american um in America and um people don't like him for the view of view that he has for Obama but yeah i think i saw an episode before with him and uh, brother cornell west yeah yeah i watched that Paul. yeah i think i think cuz i think they had a conversation ron paul and cornell west are two of my favorite people and my mind was blown when they were in the same radio station and i think that was on on uh, tavis smiley's So yeah. maybe I'll have to throw in a link on that too so they they get a little a little taste of of what that looks like. Well, I just people. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I I just wanted to appreciate you again, Ohia, for coming on and anytime you got something on your chest, I want to save this space so that we can air it out. Would love that. Would love that. We always have this uh, candid and interesting conversation and I always love conversation I have with you. And uh, I was actually expecting us to talk about uh, on Epiphanius, Kedas Epiphanius, but that'll be another topic for another day. Okay, 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 okay. Ishi, 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 ishi. Welcome. Yeah, we we could take out a whole another episode on on Kedas yeah, Epiphanius, and we could read from the text too itself to give people a taste, and then you can do some of the melodies from it too, so they get a real yeah. spiritual gurusha of it. Absolutely, would love to do that. All right, all right.